thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate uh, very much the introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, this is my second time to New Mexico. The first time was a few months ago when I met Doug. And uh, my first time participating in this convention. So far, um, I, I really enjoyed it. I wasn't able to get here real early because this was our first week of classes at BYU. But I got down as soon as I could. <clears throat> so, um, I, I, I came in kind of, uh, I was sort of a late addition to the program. Uh, Doug Hawking originally was supposed to speak about Cochise and Tom Jeffords. Uh, so, if you were expecting that, you're not disappointed that, that it's me instead of Doug Hawking. But uh, I hope if you're interested in Jeffords and uh, Cochise, you'll also be interested in uh, the story of Cochise's father in law, as Doug pointed out, and fellow Apache leader Mangus Colorado. So this story is something I've been researching intently over the last three years. Um, as Doug mentioned, my training uh, is in English literature. Uh, and with a particular specialization in, in African literature, especially, uh, and the history of law and its relationship to uh, literatures of Africa, oral literature, things like that. Um, I was born and raised in rural Idaho, so you might be asking, what? How did I get from Africa, well, from Idaho to Africa, and then back to, to uh, the, the West and the Southwest in particular? And we'll talk about the Africa thing. But um, the story of my interest in Mangus Colorado uh, started probably 30 to 35 years ago. Um, my father told me a story when I was little. And I don't uh, remember exactly when I first heard it, I remember hearing it several times. Uh, but between my father and my grandmother, the story meant something like this. And if you can picture my dad, he's a retired cop. He's a big guy, six feet tall, broad shoulders. But he was also a, a bishop in the Mormon church, and he has this very sort of evangelical preacherly voice. So he would say, you know, Mangus, Colorado, I can't do it like that. But, uh, but uh, the story was that there's this great chief, Mangus, Colorado, right, in the 19th century, one of the great chiefs of the Apache. Um, and he was a great warrior. And a great leader. Uh, his name was Red Sleeves, uh, which as a child, you know, I was fascinated by that. And I remember hearing stories about how great of a warrior he was. And I lived in rural Idaho, and we were always, you know, playing cowboys and Indians, which probably isn't really politically correct today, but we were always, you know, pretending to, to kill each other left and right. Um, one of the impressive details of this story is that the, the Mangus was huge. He's a big man, and, and, and he was six feet, six inches tall. And then he had a huge head. And that was one detail, again, as a kid that stood out. He just had this really big head. Mangus because my dad had a big head as well. When I looked up and just kind of saw the, the Mangus. Um, but not only was he a great fighter, but he was a great diplomat. He was highly intelligent. And he actually wanted peace uh, with, with the Americans. Um, and, but then he, he went in under a flag of truce. And again, this is the way the story was told to me. Went in under a flag of truce, uh, tried to negotiate with the Americans. Uh, instead, they betrayed him, captured him, and murdered him. Um, then his skull, his head was cut off after he was dead. His skull was removed uh, and sent back east to the Smithsonian to be studied. Uh, and again, the detail in my mind as a kid was because it was so huge, right? Because his skull was so big. Um, not only was that uh, kind of horrifying, I mean, it's fascinating as a kid, but also kind of horrifying. Um, but another detail that really stuck was, stuck was that, that the Apache believed that the state your body is in when you die is the state that your spirit is in. And so this, this event was traumatic for the Apache because they believed that their great chief, Mangus Colorados, was without his head in the next life. And, uh, and this is one thing I remember my dad saying. And for some reason, when I picture him saying this, he's always eating cashews. I don't know why he loves cashews. And he's always eating cashews. So you can picture this big guy eating cashews. And he said, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find his skull, bring it back, and bury it with his body? And that 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 uh, wish, I guess, has rattled around in my head for the last 30 years. And different circumstances, uh, about three years ago, uh, that I won't get into in, in detail, um, brought this story home to me in a very deep and motivating way. And since then, I have felt this compelling desire to uh, better understand the history of the Apache, to better understand uh, Mangus Coloradus, and to um, try to answer questions like, what, what does this mean for my family history? I'm not Apache, I don't claim to be Apache, but I have some Apache ancestry. Uh, what do I make of that? Uh, 
what really happened to Mangus, what in the story that I was told that I grew up hearing, uh, how much of that is true, and where did that skull go? Where is it today? Uh, now, those of you, those of you who know uh, the real story of Mangus' murder, you'll probably recognize a few inaccuracies uh, in, in the story that I just told in my, in my father's version. Um, and I'll clear it up shortly, but there's another reason why this was important to me. As Doug mentioned, my grandmother, Ruby Amos Lehman, uh, was a member of the White Mountain Apache tribe. Uh, she passed away a few years ago. Um, but she was one of the reasons we grew up hearing these stories. Uh, her father uh, was White Amos, a rancher uh, in White River, uh, Arizona, on the uh, uh, White Mountain Reservation. Uh, his mother, Belle Cooley Amos, uh, married to the patriotically named Abraham Lincoln Amos. Uh, Molly Cooley was her mother. Uh, Molly was married to the famous uh, Apache scout, Cordon Cooley, uh, leader of, of a group of Apache scouts from, from the Western Apache area. And the story is that, that Molly was Mangus' granddaughter. And uh, there's been some difficulty kind of verifying that information. Um, but, uh, oh, that's Molly, sorry, that didn't show up. So there's Molly there with Corridon. Um, can't see it in the picture, but Corridon, during the Civil War, got shot in the nose, and so he's only got part of his nose. He's an kind of interesting looking guy. Um, in the genealogical records that, that I've found in a few different places, the name Kasori Colorados has been used to refer to uh, um, uh, Molly's mother. I don't know if that's true. I haven't found that anywhere else, and I don't know where that came from. Um, but again, the story is that one of Mangus's daughters married Chief Pedro, and their daughter was Molly. And she had a sister named Cora. Um, but of course, that means uh, Mangus Colorado's uh, was her father. So this is this is this is the story. It wasn't just a, a great story about an Apache leader, but this was a story about an ancestor, uh, about an ancestor who. And, and I grew up uh, having a lot of um, pride in that, taking pride in that ancestry, taking pride in that connection, but I also kind of took it for granted. Uh, and it's not until recently that I decided to, to really start digging into it, trying to understand it better. Um, so I, I, I apologize if I'm talking about myself, but ultimately in this project, it, it is both personal and professional. So, um, so I appreciate your, your indulgence. So, so the questions that I asked before, what does this part of my family history mean? Who really was a man in Colorado? How he, is this really how he died? There are conflicting accounts of what is that, and of course, of what happened to the skull. And I, I can't answer all of these questions today. Uh, I'll try to answer some of them. The most intriguing one, right? What happened to the skull? That story is not yet complete. I'm sort of mid-stride in, in trying to answer that question. Um, but. But these, these questions about family, about history, about tragedy, uh, and, and uh, uh, possibility of repatriation have motivated this, this project and have shifted my thinking from British imperialism to thinking about you know, American imperialism in the Southwest in the 19th century, uh, and so on and so forth. So my father left out a few details uh, that I've since learned about in my research, and I'll try to fill in the blanks a little bit here. Uh, Doug did a great job, I appreciate uh, that you mentioned Mangus a little bit, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of those stories as well. Um, but uh, just know that there's much to be learned about Mangus. Evan Sweeney, uh, of course, wrote the kind of definitive biography, uh, and I'd encourage you to read that if, if you're interested. So um, Mangus was born around 1790, we don't know exactly when. Uh, to the Badonkahe Band of Chiricahuas uh, near Santa Lucia Springs on the headwaters of the Gila River, as Paul, Rutten, Paul Hutton writes. Uh, and I listed Membreño Chihene Mescalero here because um, I'm still kind of sorting out the, 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 the different local groups and bands and the names and the relationships to each other. Um, but it's important to know about Mangus that uh, he built alliances, powerful alliances with other uh, Apache bands. And so this is why Cochise was his son-in-law. He married a daughter uh, uh, to, to Cochise and built an alliance there. And, uh, and again, the story that I've been told that he married one of his daughters to uh, the chief of the Western Apache, uh, who, uh, um, so he built an alliance with, with the Apaches in Arizona. Um, so Mangus' birth name, uh, his Apache name, as I understand it, and, I, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, I'm sure I am, 
but uh, was Dasoreje, meaning he just sits there, which is an interesting name that does not do a good job of kind of looking ahead to what he becomes. It's very active, very powerful individual, but he just sits there. Uh, and elsewhere, Kandazistlishichem um, uh, is another name that, that he's been given. Um, but as he grew and rose to prominence within his community, he was called Fuerte or Strong, as Doug mentioned, uh, and later Mangus Coloradus uh, for Red Slaves. And the origins of that name aren't entirely clear, but uh, in some places it's been mentioned that he had a preference for red calico shirts. Uh, and then elsewhere, because of the great battles that he was in, he had the blood of his enemies on his arm. So it kind of, it kind of could be both, I suppose. Now there are no records that really give us a lot of information about his upbringing uh, in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Um, so we can only speculate, but Paul Hutton, author of the uh, book Apache Wars, um, and a professor here in New Mexico, is that the University of New Mexico? Yeah. Uh, it gives us a beautiful and admittedly romantic description of the world in which we can see Mangus as a young man. And I just love this paragraph, it's very nicely written. Um, he grew to manhood amid, amid the grandeur of the Mogollon Mountains, where great stands of Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and aspen sheltered wolves, bears, panthers, and great herds of elk and deer that fed the people. These high and rugged mountains cut by innumerable canyons afforded relief from the searing summer heat of the pinion and juniper woodlands below. It was a natural Eden, replete with game as well as a wide variety of edible nuts and berries, the mescal or agave plant, a staple for all the Chiricahuas, grew abundantly in the foothills above the desert to the east. Um, so that was the world that he grew up in, and I was thrilled uh, um, when I came and spoke to Doug to be able to go to Pinos Altos, to go to some of these places, and to see those pines, to see the land where Mangus uh, um, lived and fought, the land that he loved and fought to defend. Uh, it was quite meaningful to me. So, as I said, he, uh, Mangus kind of rose to prominence, united separate bands of Apaches in fighting against Mexico, uh, and he established himself as a singular leader, as a fierce warrior, as well as an intelligent strategist and diplomat. Um, his fierceness, uh, he, I, as far as I can tell, the number six foot six comes up a lot, and uh, so he, the, it was no exaggeration in my dad's story about how big he was. He was a genuinely huge man. Uh, uh, Jack Swilling, who um, played a role in, in Mangus being uh, ar arrested, as I'll get to in a minute, uh, was six feet tall, and some of the accounts of when they met said that he just he, he was, he was dwarfed by Mangus' size. Uh, at six feet, Swilling was a big guy, and then he stood next to Mangus and just looked like a child. Um, so, Mangus, uh, as, as I mentioned, had initially been, um, he tried to maintain peaceful relations with the Americans. Uh, he, he signed uh, a treaty in 1852 um, in which he promised to try to curb Chiricahua raids into Mexico uh, and that they would um, have peaceful relations with the Americans. Uh, and I think it's for that reason, uh, the story that Doug told about when, when Mangus approached the miners at Pinos Altos, uh, I'm, I'm sure there was some memory of that friendship, right, of the, of the, of the, the possibility of that treaty, that okay, we can get along with these people. But then as he said, it was, it was a turning point when, they, when these probably drunk miners captured him, tied him up, beat him, it was deeply humiliating to him. Um, and Cochise and other Apaches had already kind of decided that we can't, we can't have peace with these people, we need to be able to fight. Mangus was holding out for some, some kind of more diplomatic strategy, but after um, being beaten in that way, and uh, Paul Hutton says that the, the miners had laughed and whooped as the old chief staggered away into the tree beyond the camp, trees beyond the camp. And he says, as, as I, I dug it, that it would have been better for them to have killed him, for now Mangus Coloradus pledged to join with Cochise to fight the white eyes in the war to the death. Um, so Mingus fought alongside Cochise, Victorio, Geronimo, and others in some of the most famous battles of the Apache Wars. And um, Doug also mentioned the Battle of Apache Pass, uh, which I also visited uh, in, in July, um, which was fascinating. Uh, I took this picture at that time. Um, but I want to I mention the battle as well. Um, and he, he described uh, the so Mangus led around 500 warriors in an attack on the column of the California Volunteers who come from Tucson. Um, and I, I mentioned this battle, that the story of the howitzers was really interesting. At the, at the um, Fort Bowie there, they actually have a howitzer uh, on display from 1863. So it would have been one of the ones that they used, but it was that style of howitzer. 
Uh, so it's really interesting. But um, I, mean, I, I mentioned the, 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 uh, the battle here, not only because it was important uh, in the history of the Apache Wars, not only because Mangus was wounded, um, and that contributed to some of the events to come, but in searching for Mangus's history and trying to understand him and the sort of afterlife of his story, um, uh, I've, I've discovered that, uh, unlike Geronimo, for example, not many people know as much about Mangus. Uh, and yet he shows up in strange places. Uh, there's a, um, a, a Norwegian television series called Searching for Mangus Colorado from 1984. Uh, there's a, 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 a band, this kind of emo electronic band called German Army that has an album called Mangus Colorado. If you go to the website, manguscolorados.com, it takes you to the webpage of a Brazilian country singer named Bronco Billy in Mangus Colorado. And I wrote to him and I said, why, why, why the name? Why Mangus Colorado? He said, I just have a passion for Native American culture. Um, but in, in, in these things, there's also a horror film called Avenge, in which Mangus' spirit jumps into someone else's body and gets revenge on the people who, the descendants of the people who killed him. It's a crazy story. Um, it's very gross as well. Uh, but um, one of the more fascinating uh, examples of this, of this kind of reception of Mangus' story is from a, a, a Northern Irish poet named Paul Muldoon. Northern Ireland, so not anywhere near the Southwest. Paul Muldoon is an award-winning poet. He teaches at Princeton University. He was Oxford professor of poetry, a prestigious position for a number of years. Um, but he uh, is fascinated with Native American culture and history, and he also um, refers to Mangus multiple times, kind of retells stories. The skull shows up, all, all these kind of weird details. So I wrote to him and I said, hey, why? Why are you so interested in Mangus? And uh, he wrote me an email. He wrote back just briefly, uh, very kindly, and said, I've always been fascinated by the story of the Apache and their never-ending struggles against invaders. Mangus is a hero of mine. Mangus is a hero of mine. I attach another poem in which he appears. I hope you like it. And this poem is unpublished, um, but this is the poem he shared with me. It's called In the Field with Mangus Colorado's. And I'll just read this. For three days, I kept my eyes fixed on his saddle drape. Three days since our combined force of Badonka Hay and Joconan had tracked down General Carlton by his fifes and drums. Maybe because they were volunteer troops, the fighting was uncommonly fierce. I still see Mangus striding through the canyon and laying about him with a Sheffield butcher's knife. What Mangus hadn't allowed for was a pair of howitzers bringing up the rear. Those fairly took the wind out of our sails. Not only was Carlton able to stave off our attack, we were forced to retreat in disorder. Though Mangus had suffered a bullet wound, he still held on to his battle zeal as we rode to Mexico. Close shave, we smiled. Close shave. On that third day, I had one of those moments of clarity when fast forward skitters and skids to slow mo, that darkening patch of a saddle drape. Now I would perceive the name Mangus Coloradus derived not so much for, from a penchant for red calico groaning for good measure with butcher knives and beaver traps, but his blood-stained sleeves. Now, if, if, have any of you read Paul Muldoon's poetry? Are you familiar with it? Okay, this is not at all like what he usually writes. What he usually writes is dense and complicated and impossible to understand. But every once in a while, he has this, these, these poems that where he sets aside his irony, his sort of wry wit, and, and approaches something with a kind of reverence. And I think, uh, given his admiration for Mangus, this is almost an elegy uh, of sorts to, uh, to Mangus. And it's possible he wrote it after I sent him the email. I haven't confirmed that yet, but uh, nevertheless, he has great admiration for it. And I think that the, the ways in which some of these uh, writers and filmmakers and others have kind of taken Mingus' story uh, is, is contributing to a, a kind of new cultural understanding. Um, so Mingus, uh, at the Battle of Apache Pass, apparently never fully healed from the wound. And in the coming months, weary from violence, weary fighting, he determined to try, once again, a more diplomatic approach. Uh, and there are a lot of complicated details here, and I always feel guilty of giving talks because I have to leave things out. But the general kind of story, uh, in September of 1862, he sent word to Carlton uh, that he wanted peace. Uh, but Carlton didn't trust him. He said, I have no faith in him. He ordered Colonel Joseph Rodman West to attack Mangus' band, instructing him that the campaign must be a vigorous one, and the punishment of that band of murderers and robbers must be thorough and sharp. He instructed them to kill all of the men uh, in, the, in the band to protect, uh, but, but not the women and children. Um, Rodman West was later promoted to Brigadier General, and he didn't move uh, on Mingus until January of 1863. And he led 250 men to the abandoned Fort McLean, one of the forts that, that Doug uh, 
uh, pointed out there, which is near Silver City, um, actually near where the Grant County Airport now stands, if you know where that is. So there are varying accounts of, of, of what happens, different details. Uh, but what we know for sure is that Mangus was lured in with false promises, false promises of, yes, okay, let's negotiate. Uh, we want peace as well. Uh, Mangus' counsel, including Geronimo and Victorio, uh, advised them against going in. They didn't trust them, but Mangus seemed to want to give it one last shot. Um, he arrived in Pinos Altos for the parlay, still hoping for the best, but soon realized that he was being betrayed. Uh, that there were soldiers there, Jack Swilling and others took him uh, prisoner, and then he was imprisoned at Fort McLean. Now, Joseph Rodman West uh, would later become a, uh, an influential senator in Louisiana. Uh, he set two guards uh, over Mangus and told them, uh, made a strange, uh, gave them strange instructions. Man, that old murderer has got away from every soldier command uh, and has left a trail of blood for 500 miles on the old stage line. I want him dead or alive tomorrow morning. Do you understand? I want him dead. It's strange to me. I don't quite understand why why he said, I want him dead or alive, and then I want him dead again. Uh, Rodman West actually was um, accused and prosecuted, uh, I don't have the details uh, offhand, um, but for using excessive force in his treatment of Mangus. Uh, but he defended himself saying, well, Mangus, uh, he had plausible deniability, I guess, and I, don't, I wonder if that's why he said this also, uh, because then he could say, well, I, want, I said I wanted him alive, right? I said I wanted him alive. He also said he wanted to get, but it's a weird, it's a weird phrase, and it's always troubled me just a little bit. But the guards understood that he really wanted him dead. So that night, as Mangus was sleeping, the guards would heat up their bayonets in the fire uh, until they were red hot, and then stab Mangus in the legs and feet, burning him, torturing him through the night. Uh, and at one point, he was um, he sat up, and I imagine in in a sort of um, moment of, of rage and dignity that was terrifying, uh, spoke his last words, which were, I am no child to be trifled with. Uh, he said this in Spanish, I don't know how to say it in Spanish, but he said, I am no child to be trifled with. The soldiers immediately leveled their guns and shot and fired and killed him. Uh, one of the soldiers afterward uh, emptied his revolver and he shot him in the back of the head. Uh, that's one account, um, and actually, I think we are able to confirm that detail because of uh, something I'll show in a second. Um, they told uh, West what had happened and claimed that Mangus had tried to escape, and that they shot him trying to escape. And so the next day they threw his body in a shallow grave. Um, now this is devastating to the Apache people, of course, and a great tragedy by any measure, but what happened next made the tragedy even worse. So my father's story was correct, uh, that the detail about how the Apache believed the state of your body uh, in death, reflects the state of your body, or your spirit, in the afterlife. Um, the army surgeon uh, exhumed Mangus uh, the next day, or the next, in the next couple of days, removed Mangus's head, boiled it in a big black pot to remove the flesh, uh, so that he could then take the skull. He was also apparently scalped beforehand, uh, and one of the soldiers whose name uh, I don't think we have took his scalp. Uh, Paul Hutton again. He said, this single act uh, forever changed the Apache's behavior in their war warfare against the White Eyes. Um, Doc Lugier, again, if I'm mispronouncing that, I'm really sorry. Doc Lugier, who's a son of one of the other chiefs who fought with Mangus, whose name was Hu, J-U-H, Hu, uh, who continued the fight after Mangus's murder, murder, but his son, Doc Lugier, said, to an Apache, the mutilation of the body is much worse than death, because the body must go through eternity in the mutilated condition. So this was, not just terrifying, not just horrifying, not, but it was deeply, deeply insulting on a, on a deep cultural level. Geronimo himself made the remarkable statement that the murder and mutilation of Mangus Colorado was the greatest of wrongs ever committed against the Apache. I think that's fascinating. Of course, Geronimo continued to fight until 1886 uh, when he surrendered, and in all of that time, the murder and mutilation of Mangus Colorado uh, was the greatest of wrongs. And it was because of that that the, the Apache Wars intensified. Right, uh, and there, there was the, the false belief, um, Carlton's part and, and West and others that you know if we kill Mangus, maybe it will bring, a, bring an end to this. But it just made things worse. So, my research at this point, um, let's see, uh, the the Apache Wars continue, but I'm, I'm interested in following the trail of the skull. 
uh, and finding out what happened to the skull after this point. Uh, um, my father's not the only one who's longed for the skull to be returned, and I'm not the only one who's tried to look for it. Uh, we've not yet succeeded in finding it, but the memory of Mangus' murder and the theft of his skull still hang heavily for many Apache. Uh, and Doug mentioned the historical marker that he uh, was instrumental in helping uh, be erected near Fort McLean, near where Mangus was killed. Um, and the language on, on the uh, marker uh, reinforces this. It, it talks about his life um, and who he was, his significance, uh, but it concludes uh, with a brief account of his death. Uh, and it says, it ends with the mention of the skull, saying his skull was sent back east, never to be recovered. This is an open-ended story. This is something without closure, without conclusion. It's an open wound, in effect. Um, now, the best known and kind of longest standing account of what happened to the skull is that it was sent to the Smithsonian. And the origins of this story are, are fascinating to me because, as far as we can tell, it was never sent to the Smithsonian, but that myth has persisted for a number of years. Um, in part because Doc Lugier, the, the son of who, who I mentioned before in interviews with the, the anthropologist E. Ball, uh, reiterated this idea that, that um, it was sent to the Smithsonian. Uh, and there was a book called Blood Brother about the mention Mangus in the Apache Wars. It was published in 1947, but popular, uh, republished in 1980, and it told that story. And because of that book, and because of, of E. Ball's interviews and other things, uh, the Smithsonian has received repeated, uh, repeated calls um, and inquiries of people saying, hey, give us the skull back. Why haven't you given it back? Um, I, there was a, um, an anthropologist named Lucille St. Point uh, who uh, wrote a short paper in, in uh, 1986 called The Skull of Mangus Colorado, in which she tried to lay to rest the myth that it ever came from the Smithsonian. She said, we've looked. It's not here. It never came here. There was, there was just this for whatever reason, people started saying, they knew it was sent east, they knew it was taken away, and started associating east and skull gathering with the Smithsonian. Because of course they had lots of other remains. They were gathering all kinds of other skulls, uh, human and animal. And so it was sort of natural to assume that, that, that it could have ended up there. Um, now I've been working with the current uh, director of the Office, Office of Repatriation of the Smithsonian, and his name is William Belek. Uh, he's tried to do some additional research on this. Um, not just on where the school might have gone, but the origins of the story of why it went to the Smithsonian. And we've found a couple of, of articles from 1886 and 1881 that mention uh, the school being sent to Washington and sent to the Smithsonian. But we actually know where the school was at a specific point in time after 1863. Ten years later, in 1873, uh, the phrenologist, and I'll talk about phrenology in a second, Orson Squire Fowler published a book called Human Science in which he provided a detailed sketch and analysis of the characteristics of the skull of Mangus Colorado. Uh, he talks about how it was given to him. Um, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But anyway, so, so but, but this does tell us that it, at least between 1863 and 1873, for a decade after this happened, the skull was not at the Smithsonian, right? Um, uh, it was, at some point, in the hands of uh, Orson Square Fowler. Um, so there are a number of possible things, of course, that could have happened to the soul after this point, places it could have gone, which is what makes the search so difficult. But it's my belief that, that given Magnus' importance, given that they knew the identity of the skull, that it wouldn't simply have been discarded. Fowler and his family, as I'll discuss in a second, uh, valued these things, highly valued them. Uh, and so it's unlikely that they wouldn't have taken care to make sure that it was preserved in some way. Um, but to, so I'm following some other leads. The Smithsonian's kind of a dead end, I think. Uh, and to explain these other leads, I want to go back briefly to the surgeon um, who took the skull. His name was David Bell Sturgeon. Surgeon Sturgeon. Say that 10 times really fast and then curse his name. No, don't curse his name. Um, so Sturgeon was originally from Pennsylvania. This is the only picture I've been able to find of him. Uh, this was from 1890. Uh, there was a profile of, of him written. It was one of our prominent citizens. It was an article published in, in a Pittsburgh newspaper in 1890. Um, his beard, I can't help but admire. Uh, it also seems a little gross. Um, Anyway, but he was originally from Pennsylvania. He was educated at Columbia Medical College in Washington, D.C., which was absorbed into George Washington University. Uh, he volunteered during the Civil War in 1862, 
Uh, he was appointed as a surgeon, later received his commission as a major, and his commission was actually signed by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was sent to the New Mexico Territory and was present when, or at least immediately after, Mangus was killed. The one letter of his that I've been able to find, uh, and he sent it to a senator in Pennsylvania, so I know there have to be others. If any of you have any of these letters, please let me know. Uh, but the one letter I've been able to find is from May of 1863, but he makes no mention of the skull. He does express uh, his kind of, I'll just be blunt, kind of racist attitudes toward the Apache. Uh, but he also expresses this very sort of opportunistic desire to, to, to uh, lay claim to the, some of the might. He was part of, he, he had that gold rush fever as well, right? Copper, gold, silver. He's there as a doctor, but he's saying, I can get rich, or you can get rich off this place. Um, he left the army in 1864, practiced medicine in Toledo for several years, he got involved in state politics, moved back to Pennsylvania, practiced for a few years, and managed to sort of trace him around all the place. Um, we don't know exactly how he came to know Orson Squire Fowler. Uh, in his description of the skull, uh, Fowler claims that it was prepared expressly for him. He said, uh, the, the doctor prepared it expressly for me, and so its identity is assured. Uh, and he calls it one of the best contributions to phrenological science possible. Um, and this, using the term contribution, suggests that the, the skull was actually given to him. And next to the Smithsonian account, the most common uh, claim is that Sturgeon gave the skull to Fowler, and that Fowler had it in his possession, um, and that Fowler is responsible for losing it. Paul Hutton himself uh, says, for some time Fowler kept it on public display. He doesn't have a footnote about that. Uh, for some time he kept it on public display. In time, the skull simply vanished, although it was rumored to have been sent to the Smithsonian, that old rumor coming back once again. Um, William Bilek, uh, the, the Patriation director uh, at the Smithsonian thinks that Orson sent the skull to London, of all places. Uh, his brother Lorenzo, who was also a phrenologist, had an office with a collection of skulls in London. And Bilek says that if it stayed in the US, it likely would have been repatriated. He agrees that because Mangus was so famous, it's unlikely that his identity would have been lost. Uh, and so he thinks that maybe it was sent to London. Otherwise, it would have been repatriated after the 1990 law, uh, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, and so he thinks it was sent to London and therefore outside the jurisdiction of, of the NAGPRA law that required institutions to, to return remains and artifacts to the, to the tribes. Um, that side note, Repatriation Act hasn't been as effective as, as one would hope. Uh, I visited the Mescalero Reservation and met with their director of repatriations and she does not have a lot of faith in that law to be able to return things that, that have been lost. It hasn't been as effective as she uh, would hope. Um, so it's a possibility that, that it was sent to London. It seems unlikely to me, but, uh, but I have plans to go to London. I'm actually directing a study abroad there next fall. And while I'm there, I'm going to sneak off to the Science Museum uh, in London, where they actually have a skull. It's not Mangus's skull, but they have a skull that was in Lorenzo Fowler's collection. So it's possible there are others or at least some records to give us some clues. Um, but I'm convinced that Fowler wasn't entirely truthful in his hints that he possessed the skull. Uh, the conclusions by some that the skull was actually sent to Fowler from New Mexico are contradicted by a few uh, key details. Uh, but before I get to them, I want to say a little bit about phrenology just to kind of define this. Because one of the other questions is, why, why, why did, why did um, Sturgeon take the skull at all? Uh, now of course, there was, there was a, a, there's a, a tendency um, for uh, uh, soldiers and others to take Native American remains or uh, uh, artifacts as trophies, right? So there was this uh, kind of trophy mentality. Um, but, but the science, quote unquote, uh, uh, of phrenology um, also drove people to kind of think about skulls in a new way uh, and to want to collect them from different races. Um, so, Phrenology uh, today is uh, certainly considered a pseudoscience, uh, but in the 19th century there's a lot of interest in the claims that they were making, which were that you could learn the secrets of human nature, right? You could divine the secrets of human nature from the shape of your skull. Uh, now, now there's, this plays an interesting role in sort of shifting from a, a sort of a religious understanding of human nature and why people do the things they do to a sort of biological uh, basis. So they were kind of moving in the right direction, but, but they got a little sidetracked by simply claiming that the bumps on your head, the shape of your skull, uh, uh, could tell, you, tell us something about your, um, 
your personality. I asked Bill, our AV guy, to come up here. Uh, I'm going to embarrass him for a second. He has a beautiful head, and I want to illustrate a little bit. Uh, um, so this is uh, the map of uh, your turn sideways. So, yeah, so. All right, we want him to kind of line up here. So uh, they, they, they founded a firm uh, in, in the 1830s, Orson Fowler, his brother, Lorenzo, their sister Charlotte, her husband Samuel Wells, um, and they, it was all based on this philosophy that by examining someone's head, you could divine something about who they are, uh, what their skills and abilities are, what they could be when they get older, what they have the potential to be, but also what their vices are. Uh, so for example, they would use a map like this, and they would, they would look at Bill's head and say, oh, you've got, you've got strong perceptives, right? You've got strong perceptives here and here. They call them the organs. Uh, you've got strong perceptive organs. So that, that tells us that, that you're, you're highly intelligent, that you could, you could be a banker if you wanted to, or even maybe a lawyer, right? So you have great perceptives. But on the other hand, you need to be careful because you also have uh, combativeness over here, right? Your combativeness is a little bit large, which means you might be prone to drinking too much. So, Bill, lay off the sauce, okay? Uh, amativeness is over over here on the bottom, and he's got a strong amativeness, uh, which means he's, he's, he's gonna have a great, uh, happy love life. Um, I, I'm kind of making that up, but that's, that, that's the idea. Thanks, Bill, appreciate it. Um, let's give Bill a big hand. Huh? <laughs> so, Kind of nonsense, more or less, right? Uh, but it was a it was a powerful um, new idea that, that people really kind of latched onto. Fortunately, it was it's been debunked not just for being kind of nonsensical, but for being deeply racist. Uh, this um, analysis it wasn't just uh, for kind of telling people their skills and abilities, what they're good at, what they weren't, but it was also for distinguishing races. The skulls of of, of non-white races are inevitably inferior to those of, of Caucasians. Um, and this is, again, one of the reasons that, that uh, the skulls of, of people like Mangus were collected. Um, Orson's family uh, owned a, a, had these offices and this cabinet, they called it Phrenological Cabinet, and at one point, there were as many as 2,000 items in this uh, cabinet, and we don't have any photographs of it, but this is uh, a sketch of what it might have looked like. Um, most of the 2,000 items were skulls, uh, and they received skulls from the Southwest. Uh, Samuel Wells specifically mentions receiving skulls from the battlefields of Mexico and, and, and New Mexico territory. So there were probably other Apache skulls that were being sent. Uh, some of these um, uh, skeletons that were buried along the trail that Doug talked about, I'm sure some people snuck a few into their bag and sent them back east. Um, because the, the, the Fowler, Fowler and Wells paid good money. Uh, uh, Samuel Wells talked about how uh, skulls were contributed to their collection, but in the same breath he says that we paid as much as $30,000 over the last few years for this collection. In today's currency, that's almost half a million dollars. So they're paying a lot of money for this. Orson uses that same word, contributed. This was contributed. Um, contributed to us, we read that and think, oh, it was given voluntarily, or it was gifted, donated. But, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, records indicate that Orson Fowler was struggling financially um, by 1873. Uh, he had gotten into some weird pursuits. Uh, he left the family business. He wasn't just a phrenologist. He was also an amateur uh, architect. He designed the Octagon House. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these things or a few of them around, but he claimed that it was sort of the ideal form of, of living a sort of Bostonian feng shui, I guess. Uh, uh, and he also, uh, was an early proponent of sex education. And I apologize, I don't have a picture for that one. Uh, um, but, but, uh, but he started counseling young couples, uh, newly married couples, on how to have happy sex lives. And of course, as you can imagine, in the 1870s, 1880s, this didn't go over well. Uh, it was highly scandalous. His family kind of turned their backs on him. Someone published a pamphlet at one point that said, is Orson Fowler the wickedest man in America? Um, and so people didn't want to do business with him. There's some credit reports from credit agencies saying, don't do business with this guy. You can't trust him, it's risky. And so I don't know that, um, it seems unlikely to me that Sturgeon would have given it, just given it to him, right? Uh, when they were in the habit of paying for these things. Now this is confirmed by an article that I found with the help of Bill Delick, and uh, I'll try to tie this up here. Um, an article, that uh, in, published in the Toledo Blade originally and then reprinted in the Boston Evening Transcript, and I could not for the life of me find a copy of the Toledo Blade, so this is from the Boston Evening Transcript. Um, 1873, uh, this is February, 
8th? February something. Anyway, February, oh, 4th. February 4th, 1873. It says, uh, Surgeon D.B. Sturgeon, uh, who was described earlier in the art article as a, as a distinguished Toledo gentleman, um, USA being present at Mangus' death, and it, the article had told the story of Mangus' death, and deeming the head of so noted an Indian warrior a rich prize in the aboriginal craniology of the country, removed his head and prepared his skull for preservation. On the 8th, Alt, he presented it to Professor O.S. Fowler for examination. The professor gave a written statement with regard to it, and this is the interesting part, without any previous knowledge of the Indian to whom the head belonged. So it's like he, he brought it to him and said, hey, do a reading of this. I want to see what you say. He didn't tell him who it was. Um, after which the surgeon presented the skull to the professor to illustrate it in his forthcoming work on phrenology. Um, now this tells us a number of important things. Um, one, it confirms that Fowler did not have the skull until 1873. Uh, again, in many accounts it said that it was sent from New Mexico to Fowler. Um, but this seems to confirm that Sturgeon had it in his possession for a decade. That he kept it with him. He went and lived in Toledo, Philadelphia, New York, a few different places, that he took that skull with him and had it 10 years later and presented it to Orson Fowler. Uh, and Orson, who again is poor and everybody hates him, um, but he's going around giving lectures. So it's one thing that you can still get paid for is giving lectures. And he writes this book, Human Science. And, and, and the dating here, it says 8th Alt. Alt is an old abbreviation that means previous, like the month previous. So it suggests, again, um, I don't know the exact when it was published in the Toledo Blade, but usually after the original was printed, others show up a couple of days later in, in other publications around the country. Um, so it seems to suggest that on the 8th of January, 1873, this is when he presented the skull to, to Orson. At that point, Orson had already written most of this book. And if, if you look at the book, uh, when, I, when I first saw the skull out of context, um, or the, the illustration of the skull out of context, I just assumed the book was a, a, a discussion of a lot of different skulls, right, or an analysis of different skulls. Then when I got, I have an original copy of it, and, and it shows up on page 1196. It's over 1,200 pages long. Orson is going on and on and on about phrenology and temperance and sex education and all kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, on 1196, with no setup, no context whatsoever, he drops in this analysis of Mengus and Skull. And when I first saw that, I thought, this, that seems weird. That seems like he just came across this and was really excited about it and decided to throw it in the book at the last minute. And the dates here from these articles seem to suggest that that's the case. So I don't think Orson ever had the skull. I think he had it briefly. He had it long enough to sketch it and to do an analysis of it. But I think, given its importance, given its significance, uh, David Sturgeon kept it. Uh, which means uh, it's the next set of clues are in, Phil are in Pe um, sorry, Pittsburgh. I've already been in Philadelphia. Didn't very much there. Uh, Pittsburgh, which is where Sturgeon lived and worked in the last years of his life. Um, I have plans to go there later this year or early next year, and uh, hopefully I'll find some answers. So this, this the story, and I'll just conclude with this, is uh, obviously incomplete, and I apologize for that. Uh, I do plan on writing a book about this entire process, and uh, so hopefully not too far into the future. Keep an eye out. Uh, I will I'll try to get it published. Um, but I have made progress in this, and I, I will continue to make progress. I was encouraged in this work recently after my visit to the Mescalero Reservation, where I spoke with Holly Hutton, the director of repatriation, and with one of Mangus's descendants, who was also named Mangus Coloradus. Uh, and it was really interesting talking to him and talking to their director of repatriation. So what, what I found fascinating was that they, they both said, yeah, Mangus is important, but there's so many other schools out there. There's so many remains that are lost, and it really kind of your attention to how big the problem is, that repatriation, the process of repatriation has not been completed. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, whether I find the skull or not, that this project will ultimately contribute to greater awareness of that problem, better understanding of Mangus, and, uh, and of this period in which the skull was lost and its significance might be found. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got a couple of minutes for uh, questions. Uh, yes, please. The question was about uh, Mangus's leadership skills. Uh, if he led by example, um, was he also like in the battle with the other with the other uh, warriors? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, he he was he was he, he led by example. He he fought alongside 
uh, the other soldiers, uh, or the other, the other warriors in the tribes at the Battle of Apache Pass, he was there in the thick of it, uh, which is how he got shot. He was there with his other warriors on the front lines fighting. Um, so he led by example. Uh, but again, what I think is interesting about his leadership skills is that he, he wasn't always quick to fight. He wasn't, that wasn't always the first answer to every problem. Uh, that he was very strategic, um, intelligent, and kind of fought when he knew that's what needed to be done. Um, but he definitely was, as, we, as I understand it, as much as, as far as we know, that he was there alongside the other warriors. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Did the uh, So the question was, did the phrenology examination confirm? Uh, yeah, but here's, here's the thing about it, <laughs> is that, um, so Mark Twain famously debunked the Fowlers, Mark Twain uh, went in in disguise and had his phrenology done. You know, paid his fee, and they said, "Oh, you know, you're smart. You know, it's fine. Whatever. You could be a banker. You know, get out of here." And just gave him kind of a, a standard, not very enthusiastic reading. And then he came back as himself, as Mark Twain, and suddenly, "Oh, you have great abilities. You're an amazing writer, of course, because you have large perceptives." And oh, this and this. And so it, it, there's, uh, it's sort of. Because they already knew who Mangus was, um, that's the way it reads. But actually, it's a good question because that article suggests that he didn't know who it was. Yeah, I'll have to think about that now. You just yeah, you just drew attention to something that I yeah, that's fascinating. Is that, it, it, it does make me wonder if his original reading is the one that he presents in the book, right? Or if he revised it 